Well, thank you very much. I, I'm thrilled to be here, and, and of course, it's just an incredible honor to be part of this uh, Stanford Engineering Heroes program, and particularly to, happy to have both of my dissertation advisors here, Joe and Bert. So thank you so much for, for, for coming. So I thought I'd start out by showing this video, because then um, when you ask questions like, what's it like to be in space? Well, a picture's worth a thousand words, and so we can kind of move on from there. Um, but it also talks, uh, shows a little bit about what NASA is doing today. So this was my fourth and final flight, um, and you can uh, go ahead and, and start the video. So a number of years ago, 2002. And it was part of the assembly of the International Space Station, which of course has, has essentially been in orbit since, uh, since 1998 was when the first element got sent up. And we've had people living on board for over 18 and a half years. So um, in this uh, particular flight, we were starting sort of what we called phase two of the assembly. We had the basic station up there, we had the US laboratory, we had an airlock, uh, but we needed to send up laboratories from Europe and from Japan, and we needed to send up a lot more solar arrays to provide power for all of that. So we had to build out a long truss structure. And what we were taking up on this flight was the very first piece that truss structure it was about 42 feet long. We called it S0, and um, it uh, right now the truss is like 350 feet long, but it didn't exist at this point. And uh, so our job was to take it up and to uh, attach it and to uh, really bring it to life. So this is the very first part of the mission, and uh, you saw. The launch, which takes only eight and a half minutes. I was the flight engineer during launch, so kind of the one in the middle there. And then we spend about a day and a half um, preparing to rendezvous with the International Space Station. Um, so we do a series of burns that get us closer and closer to the station um, in the proper orbit and uh, at the proper closing speed. And then the, the commander, Mike Bloomfield, and the pilot, Steve Frick, and I kind of work together as a team to, to perform that rendezvous. This is what we looked like um, taken from the space station. So you can see most of the payload bay is taken up by that piece of truss structure, S0. This is what the station looked like at the time. As we're coming up to dock, we're gonna attach to that big silver ball there, kind of in the middle. And uh, this is the final part of the rendezvous uh, as uh, looking out the shuttle flight deck as uh, we're coming right up to the, the space station. And this is the, the point of attachment. So the shuttle's on the bottom the space station's on the top. And after we make contact, it takes about 10 minutes to pull the two vehicles together, and then we spend a couple hours doing a, a leak check, and our commander was very happy because he was manually flying that pass. Um, we open the hatches, and um, that's the commander of the station, cosmonaut Yuri Onofranco. And there were two other astronauts on board at that time, uh, actually members of my astronaut class. And the three of them had already been up there four months at that point. And uh, so they were happy to see some new faces, I think. Um, but a week later, I think just as happy to see us leave and get back to normal. <laughs> it's kind of like when your relatives come visit. So we started transferring supplies. You can see you can transfer them between your knees as well as in your hands. And then the next morning is really when we got into the heart of the mission. And so I was one of two people operating the station robot arm, lifting uh, S0 up out of the payload bay. And then of course we were moving it around to attach it to the, the top part, the zenith part of the station. This is what the robotics workstation looks like. And one thing you'll notice is it's not by any windows, so you can't actually look out and see the arm you have to try to find some camera views that will help you um, understand where the payload is and where all the different joints of the arm are. You can see the, actually the Nile River in the background in the Gulf of Aqaba, but you have to be, um, not get distracted by that <laughs> as, you're, as you're moving it around. And this is kind of the final part, we're moving it into position, um, and then that, that claw on the right there is gonna grab around a rod and make the initial attachment and then over the next several days, we'll, we'll complete that attachment. So that's Dan Bursch and I uh, operating the arm. Dan was actually at the controls when we, when we did the um, attachment there. So over a period of the next week, uh, we did a series of four spacewalks and we needed to um, attach struts, so we actually had a good structural attachment, and then hook up all kinds of different kinds of cables. And 
And um, one of the spacewalkers, Steve Smith, is another Stanford graduate. Uh, so I didn't do a spacewalk, but I was operating the robot arm during all of these spacewalks. So we generally had somebody on the arm that we were moving around and then somebody else who was um, uh, floating. And these next several views are taken by the spacewalkers. So they have uh, cameras on their helmets. And so you can see them looking down at their hands. A lot of what they were doing um, was attaching cables, which would provide power or bring power back the other direction or allow us to send commands or receive telemetry. And there were actually bolting down um, the struts that uh, really attach that piece of truss structure. This is in the middle of one of the EVAs. There's actually a person on the end of the arm holding a piece of equipment that looks like a V that you can kind of see there. And at the end of an EVA, this is the astronauts coming back in and we'll get them out of their suits um, and uh, move on to the next day. This just shows some scenes. In, this is inside the shuttle itself, uh, where we're kind of hosting a meal for the station crew members. And they sort of did the same thing another night where we all went over to the station and ate there. Um, this is uh, Rex Walheim, one of our crew members. Uh, he's doing a, a video con with his two little boys. Uh, this is Steve Smith showing uh, what happens when you let liquid loose in the middle of the cabin. And uh, finally, at the end of the week or so, we had completed everything we needed to do on the mission. So we uh, closed up hatches, making sure we had the right number of people on each side. And, um, and then we um, end up separating away about 400 feet. So again, I'm working with the commander and pilot um, as we actually do the undock um, and, and move back about 400 feet. And then we did a complete fly around of the station um, so that we could uh, photograph it from every angle to help with future assembly missions. So the pilot, Steve Frick, is at the commands right now. This is about 400 feet away. You can see sunrise happening, which happens really quickly when you're traveling at 17,500 miles an hour. And, um, and then Steve's gonna start this fly around and uh, the, uh, the rest of the crew members are gonna be taking photos and using a laser ranging device to make sure we're staying the, the right amount of way. Um, this is what it looks like when we're about halfway around. You can see the station at this point just has one solar array to power it. And, and um, starting out this truss is gonna, what's gonna allow us to bring up more solar arrays and attach them. So this was probably our last final good look. That rectangle in the middle is what we just added to the station. And then we did a burn that moved us quite a bit further away from the station. Um, we spent about a day um, checking out all kinds of systems on the shuttle to prepare us for re-entry, re all the different jets. Um, and then this is the final morning of the flight where we're closing the payload bay doors. We're getting into the suits that we need to wear for launch and landing. Um, and then uh, getting in our seats and doing the final burn. And this is at the very last part of re-entry. Um, the commander's flying manually at this point, um, essentially uh, gonna line us up for the final landing at uh, Kennedy Space Center in Florida. So you can see on this heads-up display, on the left is the airspeed, about 290 knots. On the right is the uh, altitude, so we're just going through 12,000 feet. And uh, of course, there's no engines running, right? Um, so we're really a big glider, although more like a rock than a glider, because um, it doesn't have a whole lot of lift. Uh, but it did, did have a lot of energy because of the speed that we initially started at. So that's what you're really trying to manage. You are going to land, so you want to land on the runway. Um, and, uh, and so uh, that depends both on the autopilot and then on the manual piloting skills of the commander. So when we touch down, we're still going um, 200 to 220 knots, so that's significantly faster than an airliner, and so we do use this drag chute to help prevent wear and tear on the tires and brakes and make the rollout safer. So that was the end of STS-110, that was an 11-day mission, and what I'd like to show you now is uh, what does the station look like today, and what are we, what are we doing on board today? So this is an actual picture, uh, video, of the station today. You can see um, how much bigger it's gotten, the whole truss structure that I talked about, the four solar arrays, the extra laboratories. And um, it's actually almost a million pounds of hardware that we put in space. 
and it's basically up there to do research. And uh, some of that research is very fundamental. On the outside, um, one of the experiments is the alpha magnetic spectrometer, um, sponsored by a Nobel Prize winner, trying to understand more about antimatter and dark matter. This is the U.S. laboratory. You can see it has just a whole wide variety of different kinds of equipment that you can use for um, many different kinds of research. Um, here's one that involves stem, it actually they started out as skin cells, they were turned into stem cells and then into heart muscle cells. You can actually see them kind of working together and beating. Um, and so that lets us understand more about um, how those actual muscles work in cardiovascular health. We also have a DNA sequencer on board and, and this is um, astronaut uh, Kate Rubens who actually again is a, a Stanford grad, she has a PhD in cancer biology. Um, doing the very first run um, of uh, DNA sequencing in space. Another astronaut, Chell Lindgren, who's doing some combustion experiments. You can see a burning flame looks quite different in microgravity than it looks on Earth because you don't have all of that um, uh, convection um, in, in the same way that you would have under gravity, gravity conditions. Uh, this is Scott Kelly, and this shows the freezer that we use to store samples um, prior to sending them back to Earth. So a lot of them are, are human samples, right? Blood and saliva and other kinds of things that are, are part of the research that we're doing. Do um, some capillary flow experiments to understand how fluids move in microgravity for a whole variety of uh, applications. Some of you may have even been involved in spheres because um, students around the country have written algorithms which we have then been able to test in the inside about um, how, uh, how to uh, track and move objects in space, particularly around each other. We have a 3D printer up there now, which you can imagine will be very important when we have long duration missions to Mars, for example, and you can't take up spares of every piece of equipment. We have a lot of experiments that are based on Earth um, science and understanding more about Earth resources and so actually looking down at the Earth. So the space station is a great vantage point for that. And we uh, deploy, I know we've deployed well over 100 CubeSats from the station as well as, as small satellites and that's becoming more and more a way of doing actually pretty sophisticated science. NASA itself is a customer in terms of human space flight, trying to understand how we will do long duration flight. Uh, we have this expandable module on board based on technology that was actually developed at Johnson Space Center. Uh, it's astronaut Joe Acaba in the middle of it. Um, we've grown a number of plants, mostly different kinds of lettuce, but also some flowers, zinnias and others. Um, you understand more about plant production, but also how you might be able to do this again on long duration missions. That was the first time they actually got to taste it. Um, and then uh, astronauts, of course, are themselves subjects of lots of experiments, and we're trying to understand how to keep astronauts healthy and performing well. That does involve usually a couple hours of exercise every day. About three years ago, Scott Kelly spent just about a year in space. Um, Really, the first time we'd gone much past six months, he and cosmonaut Mikhail Kornienko, and you've probably seen in the news recently some of the um, results that came from that study. And uh, just got announced that one of our astronauts on board, Christina Cook, um, is going to um, spend almost a year, probably 11 months, in space. We do lots of educational activities. This is Joe Acaba, um, again, answering questions from students, and, and that's a very common activity for astronauts up there. And uh, I already mentioned there are some experiments that look at the Earth. The astronauts also do quite a bit of photography, um, just because it's uh, partly uh, just an amazing view, but also in response to scientists' requests to, to photograph certain areas while they're up there. Uh, that's the Soyuz vehicle there, which is a vehicle we use right now to get our astronauts to and from the station. Um, as you know, we use a couple of different U.S. companies to deliver cargo. One arrived this morning, if you were watching the news. Um, the Cygnus vehicle, which is now um, own, uh, owned by Northrop Grumman, and so looks just like that. Dream Chaser is one that's going to start flying in a couple of years. And then SpaceX has their Dragon vehicle, which is actually the only one that brings samples back to Earth. 
And then we're working with two companies, Boeing and SpaceX, to develop the capability to take our astronauts to and from the International Space Station. Um, SpaceX has already had a, an uncrewed test flight, and uh, we're looking forward to the, the test flights of um, both SpaceX and Boeing, um, hopefully later this year. So this just shows what both of those vehicles look like, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to start that up in the, in the next year or so. And beyond that, uh, Johnson Space Center is in charge of developing a new spacecraft called Orion, which will go initially into orbit around the moon and eventually uh, to Mars, uh, along with a new rocket, Space Launch System, which is being developed at another NASA facility. And um, so they are looking for the first fl joint flight of Orion and SLS, which will, the first one will be without crew, um, to actually happen next year in 2020. So there's a lot going on at NASA today, and I hope that gives you uh, a good introduction to, uh, to not only what I've done, but, uh, but what NASA is involved with in terms of human spaceflight. So I think it's time to invite uh, Dean Widom up, and we'll start our conversation. Well, that was, that was fantastic. Um, <laughs> Thank you. One of my questions was going to be, what is it like to be out in space? I guess you get that one a lot, but yeah. wow, that was breathtaking. And I have to say, at the beginning of the first video, I was having some trouble listening to you because I was finding just the, it's so captivating. <laughs> um, but that was fantastic. Thank you. So uh, we're going to talk for about 30 minutes or so. I'll keep an eye on the clock and then open it up for questions Great. from the audience. Very good. So. Um, Thank you again, and thank you to the audience for being here. Uh, just a reminder, we are live streaming. Uh, I think we think many thousands of people maybe. Uh, <laughs> we'll try not watching. to think about that. So um, we're really honored to have you thank here you. and uh, celebrate you being a new engineering hero. And thank you, Joe, for the introduction to the program. I do want to just say just a little tiny bit more about our engineering heroes. It is the highest honor that we give to uh, either our alums or our emeritus faculty. And the criteria that we have um, are two. One is to have profoundly advanced the course of scientific progress and humanity. And the other is to embody the leadership qualities that inspire engineers to apply their education to have a positive global impact. So I think you've clearly done both, uh, and we're eager to hear and learn Thank more you. about you. Thank you. So I'm going to start with probably some questions that you're familiar with, uh, the first being to tell us a little bit about your upbringing and how it shaped your education and ultimately your career. OK. Yeah, so I grew up in uh, Southern California in a suburb of San Diego, um, and uh, my dad's parents were from Mexico, um, but my dad was the youngest of 12, and he was born in California, and, uh, and my mom came from uh, Oklahoma. And um, I would just say my parents were very interested in education, and, and my mom in particular, it wasn't just that she thought education was important. She just she loved learning. She just she just loved learning new things, and I, and I think it was the enthusiasm for that as much as the fact that it would be important to our futures that uh, my four brothers and sisters and I really kind of picked up on. Um, so I uh, I went to San Diego State, which was our local university. Um, it was just six or seven miles from where we lived. And when I started there, I really did not have any idea of what I was going to major in. I was thinking maybe either music or business. Um, I played the flute, and, and that had been a big part of my high school years and wanted to continue to do that. You can hear uh, I went the other way, and I actually did major in <laughs> yeah, music. So, that was so interesting. <laughs> um, and I heard you brought your flute into space once. I Is did. That right? I got to bring it on my first flight, which yeah. was uh, very satisfying for me personally. Um, and, um, but I had always uh, liked math, done well in math. I started the calculus series in high school. And um, so at San Diego State, I ended up kind of finish finishing up the, the calculus series. And uh, by the time I got near the end of, of that, um, you know, I was just talking with other students in the class and they were talking about what majors they were doing and why they were in calculus. And I was like, well, I'm just here for fun. You know, at that time, I think I was a journalism major or something. I had no idea. And, um, and uh, you know, I thought, you know, I should probably check out some of these other majors that use math because I like it and I've 
you know, spent a f you know, a few brain cells actually working on this. So I went and talked to a couple different professors. I talked to a professor in the electrical engineering department and I talked to a professor in the physics department. Got pretty different reactions from, from those two professors. The one in double E was like, well, we had a woman come here through here once. Wow. And, um, you know, but it's a pretty hard course of study. And then he had these components on his desk. And I will have to admit at the time I had no idea what they were, but they were capacitors and, you know, just various things like that. And he's like, you know, you'll have to work with these. And uh, so, you know, it was pretty um, clear he was not terribly excited about me joining their program. Um, I t went to the physics professor and um, first of all, was just much more welcoming from the beginning. And then he said, well, let me just ask you a question. You know, what kind of math have you taken already? Um, and so I said, well, I'm finishing up the calculus series right now. He's like, well, that's great. He said, um, because, you know, calculus and, and math is the language of physics. So if you started into the physics series, um, you would have already learned the language, whereas most of the students in the class will be simultaneously trying to learn the physics concepts and the language. He goes, I think you'll be far ahead of the other students. And I said, well, I never took physics or chemistry in high school, so I'm, you know, I'm kind of worried about doing that. And he's, he's like, if, if you've got the math, you know, we can teach you the concepts. And then the other thing that he said was, um, he just kind of painted a picture of different things that you could do with a physics major, which was really important to me because I really had no concept. I mean, I didn't know any scientists. I didn't know any engineers. When you majored in physics and you graduated, I just, like, I had no idea in, in my head, you know, what it was that you did. Did he say you become an astronaut? And he did not. Oh, just <laughs> um, in, in fact, this was about a year before the first women astronauts were selected. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, um, but that was really important. You know, and one of the areas in particular at San Diego State that they uh, specialized in was uh, um, radiation health physics. So I didn't end up going in that direction. But it gave me something concrete to think about, right. which was really important to me. Boy, what different reactions yes. you got from those two people. And it's amazing how it made a difference. It can just yeah. change the course of your career, just talking to a particular person, ultimately, maybe yeah. a mentor who has yep. a big influence on where you go. Yeah. But you finished your physics at San Diego State, and then yeah. you decided to come to Stanford in electrical engineering. Yeah. So there must have, you must have dabbled a little bit right. along the um, way. A couple things happened. So um, one of the things they required was a, a senior research project. Yeah. And um, again, I was taking more math. I ended up getting a math minor. And one of the classes I took was uh, for eight transforms. Of course, we use Ron Bracewell's book, like sort of everybody did. And I remember at the very end of the course, the last week or two, they talked about, well, um, you can actually take two-dimensional Fourier transforms, spatial, um, using lenses, so optically. And I thought, wow, that's a really interesting concept. And they had just hired a fairly new professor at San Diego State who, uh, w whose focus was optics. So I went and talked to him, and I said, well, I think I'd like to do my senior research project in something having ah, to do okay. with, with optics so that was a transition. And, and image yeah, processing. Yeah, yeah. And then I did a summer um, la sort of research assistantship um, at Los Alamos. Um, mm -hmm. At that time, it was called Scientific Lab. And there was actually a woman staff member um, there that uh, was somebody I worked with. And she said, have you thought about graduate school? She happened to have met Joe Goodman because he had come by the lab and talked or something. And it just sort of all came together. And, and I applied to several different schools. But I specifically came up here to see if there was a possibility of poten potentially joining Joe Goodman's group. That's fantastic. Yeah. And another because example of a conversation that set you on a particular <laughs> exactly. course, it sounds like. So tell us a little bit about your time here at Stanford. So you were here as a double E graduate student yes. um, in yeah. got your master's, your mm -hmm. PhD. Mm -hmm. uh, and so tell us, we talked a little before uh, about the experience of being a woman in a program that didn't have too many and <laughs> Latina as well. So yeah. tell us a little bit about that. Maybe also when you started thinking about being an astronaut. Well, it was while was I was here. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, very absolutely. interested to hear about that time in your life. So, you know, on the one hand, um, in the five years that I was here, I never saw or talked to a woman professor. 
Um, on the other hand, when I joined Joe Goodman's research group, I was telling you earlier, I was the third woman out of six at that time yeah. in his group, which was, I can just say, highly unusual. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but it was, um, you know, it was a it was a comfortable group, and and I was very lucky that both of my advisors um, w were very supportive. Never seemed to question at all that you know I should be here, that I should be doing what I was doing, or or that I could succeed in what I was doing. And I think that was um, hugely important. Yeah. And as I've gone through my career, and I've heard stories from lots of other women and underrepresented minorities. Um, Many of them were not nearly <laughs> as fortunate as I was in, in the experience that they had in graduate school. So, so I actually even did a small little research project the very first um, quarter that I was here. You know, it wasn't the topic that I ended up doing my, my dissertation on, but it was just sort of a little bit getting into um, doing some research that was um, a little bit theoretical and actually led to my first paper. Um, and then, you know, ended up um, coming up with a, you know, research project in the optical information image processing area, which so is the area, area that I was interested yeah, in yeah. when I came here. So that worked out. Um, so yeah, yeah. Um, I got to participate in music the whole time I was here. Oh, great. So I played a, a little bit at first in the wind ensemble and orchestra, but then mainly did um, some solo recitals and actually also soloed with the Stanford Chamber Orchestra while oh, I was wow. here. Oh, wow. So you were yeah. serious. Yeah. And <laughs> that's great. I was. Yeah, that's fantastic. But that was a great thing about Stanford. Um, at that time, I don't know if it's still still the same way. So through my research assistantship, my tuition was paid for. Right. But if you took music lessons, there was a, an extra fee on on top of that. Um, but the music department solicited, um, you know, donations. So I actually had um, kind of a, a scholarship or whatever you might call it that paid for my lessons as so, well. So interestingly, and, we have a fund yeah. now where we pay, and I, maybe it's the same It could be one. the same one. We yes. pay for the music lessons for yeah. about 30 engineering Is students that right? every so, quarter. So, I, And that was started by the dean either, before the dean before the dean before me. Okay. Um, I think I got that right. Um, so it may be that, that very same Jim one. That was started by Jim Gibbons, I don't um, know. Yes, it might and, be, that's amazing, um, yeah. So that made it, Really, it was really helpful to me to be able to do right. that. Well, as a former musician myself, I was an undergraduate <laughs> music major. When I was in graduate school, I was at Cornell, and like you, I was extremely active in the music yeah. scene. Yeah. I always get the question, do I still play? And so I'm going to ask you that. Do you still play? I do. And um, so I retired from NASA last year, moved to Boise, Idaho, and within three weeks, I had a, prof you know, a, mu a flute teacher. I wanted oh, to go back. Fantastic. And I just bought a new flute two months ago, the first one since I was 16 years old. <laughs> Um, so yeah, that, that's one of those things that I continued to practice a little bit over the years right. just so I could come back to it someday and now that day has come. So okay, so excited. when I retire, <laughs> my trumpet will be coming back out. All so right, so I, I did want to talk a little bit about, so the first year I was here, my master's yeah. year, near the end of that year is when the space shuttle flew for the first time. Yes. So it was a big deal, very a different kind of spacecraft than had ever existed before. We only had capsules. And it, it was capable of doing so many different things. So within um, a couple of years after that, um, you know, people were, it, it was being used to actually bring up laboratories, do research in space. Um, also, uh, a, a couple of years after it flew for the first time, Sally Ride flew. That was a big deal for me because yeah. obviously first American woman, but she had been a physics major and she had been at Stanford. And I don't know that without some of those connections, it, you know, I would have even have had that idea, like, is this something I could actually do? You didn't overlap at Stanford. No, she was I, I got to meet, you, I know Sally you, later, oh, you did. but okay, not at yeah. Stanford and yeah. not actually at NASA. It was actually yeah. after she left NASA. Right. Um, but um, that was just all really helpful. And then also that year, uh, NASA was opening up applications for about three months because they were going to select a class the next year, which would have been 1984. And um, uh, I was around a bunch of Aero Astro students, and they were all talking about, well, we're going to send in our application. And I was like, so you can just do that? Is that how you apply? I, like, I had no idea. How does somebody apply to, to be website. an astronaut? Yeah, yeah no <laughs> websites at that point. And, 
and I, you know, I don't know what I thought, that people were like anointed or something, but um, uh, it was really the first time that, you know, people were talking about it and then I, uh, that I gave it any thought at all. So I wrote NASA and got sort of the brochure about how you apply, but I decided to wait until I actually got my PhD because I just thought, you know, if you're going to apply, I at least want to be competitive. And I Did figured. Did your advisor know you were applying? Um, I, I believe I told him. Yeah, I didn't tell too many people, because it just seemed so outlandish. <laughs> On the other hand, less outlandish at Stanford than almost anywhere else. Um, so I, you know, I think it's definitely part of it that that is something that people who who go to Stanford think about doing, mm -hmm. among among many other um, pretty amazing things. Yeah. So. So I wanted to come back a little bit to um, being a woman and being a Latina and your experience in choosing to major in engineering. And you touched on that. Um, we're working on, on that here at Stanford. I think we're making some good progress. But I just wanted to ask, what advice do you have for our students if they're not always feeling as included yeah. as they might? What can we as a university do, as a dean of engineering do, to make more mm -hmm. progress? And maybe what companies and organizations could do as well? Just your thoughts about where we are and how to keep getting better. Yeah. So, so oftentimes now, I think students sometimes have a teacher or a mentor in high school that has helped them think about um, coming to a university and maybe majoring in a technical field. But what is often the case is that they get to the university and then that person isn't there. Right. And it's a, you know, it's a big place. And of course, you major in a science or engineering field, it's going to be difficult. I mean, at some point you're going to come up against, you know, problem sets or whatever it is and, and you're going to be struggling. If, if you don't have that person to turn to, I think it's very easy to say, you know, there might be something easier <laughs> that right. I can do. Right. Uh, some things I um, know about now that I didn't when I was in school is that, of course, there's lots of organizations that have student chapters, you know, whether it's Society of Women Engineers or Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers. Um, and um, those student chapters, can, I think, can be really helpful. And it and it's, would be really good if students knew about that mm -hmm. from before they even stepped on campus mm -hmm. to say, hey, here's a place where you might find people that are a little bit more like you right. and where you may feel a little more comfortable um, talking or sharing your story or hanging out or, or whatever it is. And I actually just, because I kind of, as you can see, just fell into these areas, you know, in a way that wasn't initially planned, you know, I didn't, I didn't really know about those and I, I didn't um, have those areas, but, um, but you had I've some spoken at a lot of, I it did. It sounds like you had I strong did. mentors along yeah. the way. Yeah. yeah. Right. And that was extremely helpful. Right. Um, and so it is something where um, I think fa faculty members can make a huge difference mm -hmm. in, in how they approach it and welcome and um, try to understand, okay, you know, what other resources do we have here? And of course there's tutoring and I would go to professor's office hours and stuff like that mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, if, if I had a question about what, what we were working on in class. We hear sometimes from some students who don't even quite know what office hours are about <laughs> or are afraid to go to office yeah. hours and those are often students from less traditional backgrounds. And well, I think partly because I didn't know where else to go. I was like, well, if I have a question, you know, this is the only thing I can yeah, do. So yep. I started doing that as an undergrad in physics, and, and it was a fairly small department there. So um, once I had been in there a semester or two, I think it was a little bit easier because you started to get to know the people and the professors. Right. Um, when you're in a very large department, and double E is, is really large here. Um, it, I think it could be a little bit more intimidating. Right. And so anything that you can do to say, here's a smaller community that you can be part of within your department or you know, within your school, I think it makes it easier for people then to say, oh, here's, here's a resource I can take advantage right. of. Right, right. And I was very fortunate also monetarily in that um, I had a, a fellowship from the School of Engineering for the first year I was here. And then I had these research assistantships mm -hmm. the rest of the time. Right. And, um, and I know this is hard to believe, but at the time I went to San Diego State University, they had no tuition you know, supported by the state. I see. And, um, and then I even got um, a scholarship from the school that paid for like parking and books and you know, the fees, the you know, med you know, right. medical plan fees and all of that. 
So in 10 years of college, I, my family n never paid, paid for anything. any tuition. That's fantastic. That, um, yeah. And you know, I know that can be a barrier. And right. so to the extent that schools and universities um, are able to provide support, making sure that students know about that right. is, is incredibly important. Right. Yeah, sometimes just communicating. Yes, is, it's an <laughs> you can make assumptions yes, about this absolutely, is impossible. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, one thing I'd like to turn to while we have a little time, um, you're obviously well known as an astronaut and we got a wonderful sense of that from the video, but you are also extremely successful as a manager and a leader. And so just want to turn to that a little bit. And in particular, I believe it was December of 2002, you had just been named Deputy Director of Flight Crew Operations at the Johnson Space Center and two months later there was a disaster during the mission of Space Shuttle Columbia. I wonder if you could tell us about that experience and what kind of leadership was required in that situation. Yeah, so, you know, if you work in human space flight, that's the worst possible thing that can ever happen. Right. Where you lose a crew and you lose a vehicle. Right. And, and we weren't even sure if we had maybe lost human space flight, you know, because for a while they were talking about maybe we'll never fly the shuttle again. Mm -hmm. So that morning, this was the first flight since I had been named to this management position, Deputy Director of Flight Crew Operations. And so the way that we approached um, launches and, and landings was the director was in Florida, and then I was in mission control, um, essentially the crew representative mm -hmm. um, in both of those places. So I was in mission control in this, um, and really you are there in case something happens. <laughs> but, you know, the whole time I had been at NASA, because I came in a few years after Challenger, you know, nothing had really ever gone wrong. Right. Um, but um, I was there, and, and of course, you kind of have this big book of procedures in case something does happen. And, and I remember before this flight launched, you know, actually going through the book and um, trying to understand what are my new responsibilities now in, in, in a particular situation like this. So, but of course, it was just almost, uh, it was a huge shock, almost unbelievable. Right, that, I'm sure. And, um, and, of course, and of course, it wasn't really clear initially exactly what had happened. But probably a half an hour after what would have been landing time, we had our first you know, mishap response team meeting. And I was there as the crew representative. And so um, we, already, we already have people named who can be ready to deploy to a site um, and so those people sort of knew who they were and they were gathering up their things and, and we were in the midst of saying, okay, what data do we need to start collecting? And, um, but then we also had the, re the responsibility, since we managed the astronaut office along with the chief of the astronaut office, to, um, to work with the families um, and, wow. and do all of that personal stuff as right. well. So my boss, the director, uh, was actually with the families in Florida, and then they came home that day. And um, the the interesting thing is, I don't think any of us had ever thought about a scenario where a shuttle would break up two hours from our space center in in Texas. So I remember not too long after it happened. Uh, I mean, you know, two or three hours. Um, some of the astronauts called me up and they said, well, we're out at Ellington Field. That's where our aircraft are. And um, uh, we think we can get a helicopter up to East Texas and we want to go up there right now. I'm thinking like, okay, that was really not, <laughs> you know, I, I, I had to call a few other people to say, okay, what, how do they actually do this sort of recovery operation where they're actually, you know, looking for our crew members. Right, right. Um, and so we had to get with the flight docs and, and some of that thing and try to coordinate that. But, I mean, we had people up in the field within just a few hours right. after it happened, which is not a scenario I'd ever thought about. But we, there were so many things to think about, you know, um, the families, all the other astronaut families <laughs> and, and astronauts. Um, and then just working with the NASA team as well as with the external um, investigation board that was assigned to we understand what had happened. And then, you know, we spent two and a half years figuring out what changes do we make, need to make to the shuttle to fly mm -hmm. again. And, and there were opinions all across the board, even within the astronaut office from 
we should never fly again to we should go fly without making any changes because this is just the risk that we sign up to take and we can never make it we can never make it risk-free and of course uh, there was a middle ground that we settled on which is we need to be able to inspect Um, we need to be able to at least have a chance at doing a repair you know if we had the same kind of issue and of course we made a number a number of other changes as well and a lot of it had to do with not just the technical part of what had gone on but um, we were faulted rightly for did we have the right communications among all the members of the team Um, you know there were people who were much more worried about what had happened on launch than I had ever heard about during that mission and the right conversations with the right people never quite happened I see and so we had to work a lot over the next couple years of how do we get people to talk how do we get the right conversations happening and and a lot of it has to do with making sure that everybody on a team feels valued and respected Um, so it goes a lot to actually inclusion right because if you don't feel like somebody's going to listen to you or pay attention to what you're saying you're not even going to speak right and um, and so that was something that I had the opportunity to emphasize the whole time I, I was in management leadership positions that not only is this the right thing to do because everybody has something to contribute it also directly affects the safety um, of our folks right. and of our assets well maybe that goes right into my next question which is that you eventually had an e- extremely important leadership role as the director and you've retired now and looking back <laughs> looking back on it what's your biggest leadership lesson or leadership advice let's say to the room of future leaders here um, what's, yeah what's well the one or um, two things so uh, so I learned a, of course a lot from all the people I interacted with um, particularly at NASA and I always kind of uh, give a little nod to some of my uh, buddies who were in the Marines because they said well okay there's two things that you have to do You have to accomplish the mission and you have to take care of your people. And they said, you know, usually people go with three, but we're Marines too. Two things. (laughs) (laughs) So really every job I had, that was what I needed to do. So it was really about how do you define the mission? Mm -hmm. And and as a center, so as an astronaut, it's pretty simple. Mm -hmm. You're assigned to a shuttle mission. Here's the goals. (laughs) You know exactly what your mission is. Um, As you go further up in leadership, it becomes a little bit more amorphous, right? Exactly. Um, But I I always thought about it as we have today's mission and we have tomorrow's mission. And today's mission are the programs that we are funded to work on today. So that was the International Space Station. That was our operational program. So we're responsible not only for the safety of the astronauts and of the vehicle itself, but for them being productive and getting as much done as possible. Um, Another part of today's mission was um, developing the Orion spacecraft and working on the commercial crew program. Tomorrow's mission is, you know, how do I make sure that 20 years from now, Johnson Space Center is still leading human spaceflight for the country? Um, You know, how do I make sure that we have the right um, workforce with the right skills, that we have the right facilities, which sometimes means getting rid of some facilities because you need something different in the future that we have the right processes, that we've incorporated new technology, um, probably, probably okay new, new partners. Yes, new partners. exactly. Uh, the video brought so that up. So when yeah. I talk about new processes, yeah. it's really working with um, the commercial industry in yeah. a different way right. than we had, al- we had always worked with them, because we never manufacture anything, right? right? Um, but we had always um, designed the vehicles uh, and, and given very... Um, detailed designs to contractors who then manufactured them right. and then we owned the vehicles and we operated them and we had already started with the cargo vehicles of operating this very different model yep. where we provide instead high level requirements we let these companies design and show us how they're meeting the requirements they own the vehicles we acquire services from them through contracts mm-hmm. and um, they operate the vehicles and then obviously it becomes quite a close partnership when they get within, you know, uh, a few hundred yards of the station where they can't move in until we give them a go because we've got to make sure the, the their vehicle is operating the way that we're expecting and that it's not going to 
do any harm to the station itself. But, but they're essentially in charge of their vehicle, so that was quite a bit different way of operating. That is and with change. the commercial crew program, it's much the same way. Right, right. And, um, and as you see, really with everything that NASA is doing now, we try to understand how do we um, work with commercial companies. A lot of them are much newer companies than the, the standard sort of aerospace companies we had already worked with. Right. And in which, what ways can we encourage them where they actually um, have more of a stake and they have the ability to sell their services to other customers. Now right now in the human spaceflight world, you know, NASA really is <laughs> the customer, but the idea is there should be other customers coming along. Right. We want there to be other customers and we eventually want to be just one of, of the customers. Right. So I have one last question. I think probably people are anxious to also ask you questions. We were talking beforehand about the fact that books on leadership are often written by white males. Uh, one of my colleagues is a female, um, Tina Selig. She specializes okay. in leadership, yeah. entrepreneurship. And she wrote a book that was called uh, What I Wish I Knew When I Was 20. <laughs> so my last question is, what do you wish you knew when you were 20? Uh, well, let's see. When, when I was 20 was actually the year women astronauts were selected for the first time, women and minority astronauts. So if you'd asked me 19, I would have said, hey, someday women will get to be astronauts <laughs> because it wasn't much before that when you really couldn't hardly even conceive of that. Um, but in the context of leadership, what I, what I will say, which is something I didn't realize for a long time, is that you can actually be a leader at almost any age and in almost any position. And I was very much um, throughout most of my career um, just sort of of the view of, well, leaders are way up here and they get that way because they have this title that they're given and they have this, a large number of people that report to them. Um, and for a long time, I, I really never saw myself doing something mm -hmm. like that. Or, and I didn't think of myself that way. Yeah. But I have met so many people, so many people I'm sure you, you see these students at Stanford who, who start their own nonprofit or they're working with high school students. They, they have already realized, you know, I can be a leader at right. that point, yep. um, at a point when, when that just never occurred to me. Mm -hmm. So um, one of the quotes that I um, often use, and I think it's attributed to John Quincy Adams, I hope he's the one that actually said it, I don't know, because you hate to not attribute it right, but it says, um, if your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, do more, and become more, you are a leader. Mm -hmm. And I would say quote. I went through a good part of my life, you know, not, with, not understanding that or not having that as an impression. And I think there's a lot more I could have done along the way, and, and particularly probably in, in mentoring others, mm -hmm. um, if I'd had that different mindset. Right, right. Yeah. That's great advice, I think, to the young people yeah. out here. So speaking of the audience, let's go ahead and maybe we have about 20 minutes, I think, okay. to take some questions from okay. the audience. And I see there's quite a few. So uh, let's see. I guess there's a mic. Um, so we'll just pass there's that around. Run around with, I yeah. think we have and several there's people one right, with microphones. Right in that same row over here that you can be next. Uh, Hello, Dr. Ochoa. Um, I wanted to ask you about uh, what, what are you hoping NASA will be doing in the next 10 to 15 years? <laughs> well, of course, uh, you may have seen, and I'll speak mainly on the human spaceflight side. Of course, there's a lot more to NASA, and they have very exciting planetary science missions and heliophysics missions and, and do a lot of great Earth, Earth science um, research as well. In the human spaceflight side, NASA's just been... Um, told that we should be landing people on the moon in 2024. Now, we don't have a human lander at the moment, <laughs> and we're still working on the spacecraft and, and the rocket. Um, but, uh, you know, I hope that there will be some extra resources applied to that because I, I really think, well, what I've seen is if you set your mind to it and, and you have at least appro somewhat appropriate resources, there's really nothing a team of people can't achieve. And, and there are amazing people at NASA and, and at many other places. So I would, I would like, we've been talking for so long about we want to move out beyond low Earth orbit. Uh, and, you know, we want to, of course, get people to Mars at some day. I think the moon is a great test bed. 
in many cases, for many of the types of things that we would need to understand to go to Mars, and it would be nice to be just two or three days away instead of eight months away when you realize you haven't thought of everything. Um, in terms of a lander, though, it doesn't help you at all because, you know, on the moon there's no atmosphere, on Mars there is, you're going to have a very different kind of mechanism that would land people on, on Mars. But um, the, it, it serves as a great test bed in addition to being um, an amazing scientific uh, location. So I will, I hope that we do get to spend a lot of the 2020s, you know, in orbit around the moon, landing on the moon, having various different kinds of scientific payloads there, maybe understanding how you can um, robotically develop fuel and oxygen from the, you know, the lunar regolith and what's there, and that we can um, eventually use that to, to get to Mars. I have kind of a personal question. Um, how so you you were married around the time that you were around your first like flight or your acceptance in the yeah. astronaut corps? Yeah. How did your husband respond to your acceptance <laughs> and also like the rest of your family? Because I broached this with my parents and my family and everybody's very much against it. So. Is that right? Oh, okay. Yeah. So I so I actually so uh, so I was actually um, dating somebody who became my husband when I got the call um, about getting selected for the astronaut corps. So. While we were dating, he knew that this was something that I wanted to. I had already applied once a couple years before, um, uh, before he had even met me and, and had had the chance to interview once before. So he sort of knew that that was what I wanted to do. And he was an engineer. He was in the middle of getting his PhD in computer engineering from Santa Clara University. So, um, so that, that was just part of the conversation from the get-go. But I do remember after I got the call, it was like, well, I'm going to Texas. Are you coming or you know, are you staying? So we ended up getting married before, um, right before we, I, we moved to Texas. But he actually stayed here a few more months. And then he did his PhD sort of long distance. But a lot of it was computer simulation. So, so he could kind of continue to work on that. So he was 100% um, for it. And um, I, I can remember on my first flight, so the families get to be on the roof of the vehicle assembly building at, at Kennedy Space Center. We always have an astronaut there with them, usually two, who are sort of the family escorts. And the, the astronaut who was our family escort on that flight, um, after the flight, he told me, OK, this is the first time I had a spouse on the roof who had a stopwatch who was looking for all the abort calls and knew exactly when they were going to come and was listening for every single one of those <laughs> you know, during the launch. Um, so, uh, so he, you know, he actually had um, done some work with McDonnell Douglas uh, looking at um, how you determine when a shuttle main engine might not be working correctly. So he had a lot more knowledge about the shuttle than maybe most, most spouses did. So that was really good. Um, you know, I was always really glad that my mom was very excited about it as well. And she was at all four of my launches. And she actually would usually stay in Florida because at that time, of course, we didn't have tablets. You couldn't just pull up NASA TV anywhere. And she didn't get it in San Diego on her cable channel. And so she would stay in Florida so she could watch me during the launch. Now, I will say all four of my flights were before we lost Columbia. And she may have had quite, quite a different um, uh, reaction, you know, or been a lot more worried uh, of me launching after that. But she, sent, she told me one time, well, I, I just trust things are going to go OK. And I know you're doing what you want to do. So she was very excited for me. Um, thinking, back to your, uh, thinking back to your experience between, say, the age of 20 and when you got selected as an astronaut, is there a particular thing that stands out in your life as something which contributed to you getting selected as an astronaut or perhaps later for your later success in your career? Yeah, so, so obviously having a good, ed, a good education in, in science and engineering, and a lot of astronauts do have PhDs. They pretty much all, all have advanced degrees in some way, shape, or form. Um, the first time I, I went to interview, I, so I was working at Sandia National Labs in Livermore. That was my first job um, after getting my PhD. The first time I went to interview, um, uh, it was great because it was the first time I actually ever actually talked to an astronaut and asked him sort of, what is the job really like? What's your day-to-day -day life like? And got to see the training facilities and, and learn more about it. But the, the thing I realized that I didn't have 
was any kind of experience in an environment where you have to make decisions that can affect life or death, you know, an, an operational environment. I mean, I worked in a laboratory um, and, and I wrote papers and I talked at conferences. Um, and most of the other um, candidates, well, of course, a lot of them were, some of them were professional, I mean, military test pilots. Um, most of them had at least a private pilot's license. And the ones that didn't, they, you know, maybe they climbed mountains or they were scuba divers or they had worked in Antarctica, you know, so they all had something that said, hey, I'm not just going to become a quivering mess, you know, when, when I'm in an environment where bad things can happen and maybe bad things are happening. Um, and I really didn't have anything like that. So I did end up getting a private pilot's license um, and to give me at least, you know, that experience of being in charge of an aircraft uh, when you're flying and, and having to know that at some point something could go wrong and, you know, I would have to be the one that would have to figure out what to do. So that was one of the things that I did. And then I also, after that first interview, I decided I would like to work for NASA, even if I never get selected as an astronaut, because I, I just, like, I support what they do, and you want to be some, part of something bigger than yourself. And um, so I actually went to talk to Joe Goodman and said, do you know anybody at Ames Research Center? I think, I think there's a couple, you know, some folks that do a little bit um, of work in the area that I'm in, optical processing. And in fact, he, um, he gave me the name of a person there who was a division chief who ended up hiring me. So. Do you still fly privately? I don't. Yeah, you know, at some point, um, the time that it takes, you know, if you're going to be a private pilot, you either have to fly quite regularly or you're going to scare yourself to death. Right. Um, and, you know, with a full-time, more than a full-time job and then two kids and, you know, all of that, at some point it was like, and I was trying I to play the flute. I sort of sit in the back of the plane. Yeah, I was, I was like, <laughs> and, and of course I have about 800 hours in a T-38, which is what we flew in as astronauts. Uh, so I, I got to fly for a long a time. Lot. Yes. Um, I wasn't the front seater, I was the back seater, but they let you take the stick as soon as you're 200 feet off the ground, so you get, you get a lot of flying time. Yep. But this goes back to your, I was just realizing I had something to add to your question, which was um, by the time of my fourth flight, my husband standing on the roof of the VAB, with a three and a half year old in one hand and a child who was gonna turn two while I was in orbit. And I'm pretty sure at that point he was thinking like, if you don't come back from this one, I'm going to kill you. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, so, you know, it actually, especially if you have kids, it's a lot harder on the families than it is on the astronaut. And I know after Columbia, it was really hard on some of the astronauts, some who made the decision actually not to fly again. And a lot of them, my kids were very young um, at that time, like two and four. So they, they didn't really understand what had happened with, with Columbia exactly. But for astronauts who had kids, and I would say the, the age range of like eight to 13 or so was sort of the hardest because they were old enough to understand that you were an astronaut, what you were about to go do and what had happened with Columbia, but not really quite old enough to understand why you might choose to go to it anyway, you know, to have that maturity to say, well, this, I, this is something that's important, I think, to the country. It's important to me. Um, and that was, that was tough. That was tough for a, a lot of the astronauts yeah. that we had in, in the Corps at the time. Other Hi. questions? This one? Yes. Hi. Um, thank you for being here. Uh, I want to ask you about the leadership roles you took on, because the more I see, you know, like, very impressive career paths like your own. As people go into leadership roles, they kind of have to stop doing what they started doing to get there, <laughs> right? Um, and so that always seems like a really complex decision to me, right? Like you can take on roles where you can have a lot of impact and do really important mm -hmm. things, but then you stop doing what you presumably like really love because you're doing it up to that point, right? Um, so I, I'd love to hear more about those decisions, at which you had to make at several points. And I want to tack on to that. Just I want to ask what your favorite space shuttle is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any space shuttle that flew was, it was fine. I was, and the two I flew on were Discovery and Atlantis, and I was thrilled to, to be on any, any shuttle. Um, in terms of, so what I would say, in, instead of framing it as stop doing, I would say is there's different skills 
that help you be successful as you move more into a management or leadership position. And they're often ones that you haven't thought about or really worked on because they haven't gotten you to, they aren't really what necessarily got you to where you are at a certain point. But obviously, um, you know, what, so when you're in the government and you're a senior leader in, in the senior executive service, there's like five areas that you um, are evaluated on in your performance. So leading people, leading change, um, business acumen, um, building coalitions, and results driven. And I would say at NASA, nobody ever has an issue with the results driven. Like we're all completely focused on that. Not, maybe not so much on the other parts. And so those were the things that um, you know, I, need, I needed to think about and needed, needed to work on. And a lot of times um, took inspiration from people that I knew. Um, most who set a good example, a few who set bad examples that you were like, I'm not gonna be that kind of leader. <laughs> um, but I learned a, a tremendous amount from really good people that I saw at NASA. But you're, but you're right, it, it's kind of a different skill set. Um, and and it goes back to a little bit about what I talked to where, okay, I know my, I still need to accomplish the mission, but how do I define that mission? It's, it's different now. So a lot of it for me was, um, you know, it's about um, obviously ac accomplishing and being successful at the programs that, um, that Johnson Space Center runs. Um, but it's also about um, our employees um, being able to learn and grow and achieve and to feel valued. And, and again, it's about preparing for the future too, because it's very easy to get caught up um, in day-to-day -day work and not spend enough time thinking about the future. So I kind of started up this change initiative at Johnson Space Center, um, JSC 2.0, where we had, I was trying to get everybody to really rethink about how we did our work. Not necessarily what we were doing, but how we did our work. And, the, I, and I just said, look, if five years from now you're coming in and doing your job the same way you're doing it now, we're on our way to irrelevancy because the environment's changing all around us. And, and in human spaceflight, you can just see how much it's changing. And if you're not changing as fast as your environment, by definition, you are falling behind. <laughs> and it's a, it's a little bit harder with a government organization. But sometimes we don't give ourselves enough credit for things that are within our control. You know, we can make a lot of excuses of what we don't have control over, and there's lots of those things. Um, but we actually have a, a lot of leeway in how we choose to do things. And so a lot of it is about new partnerships. It's about changing up processes and trying to get people to realize as they come in every day, I have two jobs. I have the job I know how to do, and then I have the job of figuring out how I should be doing it differently, or if I should even be doing this job five years years from now. Is this, is this something you know, that we need to be transitioning out of? Um, and that's a hard thing to do, because people are very comfortable with knowing, you know, I know how to do my job, and people at Johnson Space Center have a lot of pride in what they do. And so we really, a lot of it was really working on trying to think about what should we be doing differently? How should we be doing it differently? So seeing you talk about the International Space Station and seeing all the different countries involved reminds me how science and space exploration in particular is an endeavor that crosses all kinds of cultural barriers. Mm -hmm. um, so I was wondering if you could speak to your experience working with um, other nations' space programs and what you think international collaboration and space travel will look like in the future. So that's a, a really good question, and I, I will paint you this picture. So I'm about 37 years old, and I'm in Russia, sitting across the table from, oh, four, five or six people, men, who um, are members of the Russian Space Agency or their prime contractors, a lot of them who worked on their version of the Apollo program, um, trying to negotiate how we are gonna train for and operate the International Space Station. And they're not giving me the time of day. <laughs> First of all, in all the 20 years I worked with people in Russia, you know, there was never a woman across the table from me, ever. 
And, um, and initially, I know they kept thinking like, well, we'll just wait for the person who's actually going to come in and sign the protocol, and we'll just talk to that person. And, and it just took a long time for them. To, yeah, no, it's me. I'm actually the one who's going <laughs> to sign this protocol. The one thing I had going for me is I had already been in space, and they did respect you know, um, space experience. Um, but it was, um, you know, it was, it was uh, very hard initially at first to actually get them, get them to talk to me. Um, but uh, some of the things that all of us at NASA who were over there negotiating a, a variety of different kinds of protocols. So these aren't the very high level protocols that had already been um, negotiated, the intergovernmental ones that the State Department has to sign on to and the head of NASA. These were more of the nitty gritty. How are we actually, you know, going to operate and, and work and understand about um, and control the systems and all of that? And um, we, we did have to, to learn some things. Um, one is that um, they rightly um, were the really the only um, people in the world who knew about long duration spaceflight. Um, NASA's experience to that point was three Skylab missions, you know, 130 days, 160 days, 190 days, and that was it. And we hadn't done it in quite a while. Meanwhile, they were operating the Mir space station. They'd had the Salyut station before. So every time we acted like we knew how this was all going to work, they just kind of looked at us like, you really don't know what you're talking about, you know, because long duration really is quite different than short duration. And, and, and they really were the world's experts. So we had to... You know, of course, we're all these NASA can-do kind of people. <laughs> you know, we, we had to learn, well, we have to listen. We have to show the appropriate deference to people who really have experience in this sort of new era that we were going into with, with long-duration spaceflight. So, so, and they did have a lot of really good experience. So, so it was important for us to really listen. A lot of the negotiations are based on personal relationships. And so, like, literally, even... It didn't matter who you were. It was kind of exacerbated by me being a fairly young woman at the time. But it didn't matter who you were at NASA. I mean, they weren't going to hardly give anybody the time of day for the first six months because they're like, we don't know you. We don't know, we don't know you personally, so we haven't built up that trust. And building up those personal relationships is, is, is like the beginning. You know, it's not like you just go in and, and say, here's what we need to decide in the next couple of weeks, and then we need to sign this protocol. So that was another thing. Another just really hilarious thing was we just operated very differently. And over there at that time, so this is mid-'90s I'm talking about, so not that long after the fall of the Berlin Wall and the breakup of the Soviet Union. So a lot of the processes were still very much, I would say, Soviet-like. And one of those is knowledge is power. So people sort of hoard knowledge. So for example, our people show up and we're, we're like, um, well, we, we'd like a map of Star City so we know where the buildings are, so we know how to get from one building to another, and we'd like your org chart so we know who we're talking to. You know, anytime you go to an organization, you're trying to figure out like who, was, who reports to who. No map, no org chart. Nobody will tell you who reports to who. So, you know, that was part of what we had to figure out, and yet it was you know, we just sort of expected that that would be like at the beginning and that and that was, you know, not available to us. And then we come in, we're a group of like 20 people that have um, come from Johnson Space Center and we, we all have our laptops, we have a printer. Um, and I remember in the building we were in, which was their mission control building and it had a bunch of different rooms, like I never saw a scrap of paper, like any kind of paper, like there's no bulletin boards, there's like on people's desks, no paper. Um, there wasn't even toilet paper in the bathrooms, which fortunately we'd been warned about so we could bring our own. But, you know, I kept thinking like, like I'm scribbling away notes and, and they're sitting across the table for like not taking a single note. <laughs> like, do they just remember all this? Well, you know, and, and then- They were recording it. Uh, yeah, who knows, yeah. <laughs> and, um, and then at the end, when we actually did get to a signed protocol, and, and so we're all pr we're printing out copies, like so everybody on our team has a, has a copy of the protocol and everything that's in there so we know what we did. And so we ask um, uh, the Russian team, well, how many copies would you like? And the leader said, I'll take one. 
-hmm. And again, it's like the, the leader is going to be the one that has that, import, that important piece of information, and it's, it's not for everybody else to have. So it, you know, it was very different. And then you know, um, I also had the opportunity to work with Europeans and, and Japanese and Canadians for, for a while in one of my jobs. I, I headed up a multilateral crew operations panel, and so we were the heads of sort of the astronaut offices from all five of the space agencies. And so we were the ones that actually um, selected crews for the missions. Um, and, uh, and so they all had their little different styles. And um, I, so I, I was going to start this um, story by saying, there I am, you know, sitting across this group of Russians trying to negotiate this protocol, thinking like, nothing I ever did in my PhD work it kind of prepared me. <laughs> it comes back to that other question you got about that. Yes. Yeah. yeah like right. this was not at all on my horizon. It was all about photorefractive crystals and the math and the, but why my experimental setup didn't work. And right. <laughs> you know, so. I think we have time for one last question. Okay. And we have someone back there. So last question. Thank Hi. You. Uh, I've heard in conversation with Colonel Pam Melroy that, uh, the two difficult moments for being at the astronaut office are getting in and leaving. Um, <laughs> so I was wondering if you could either highlight a little bit more about your time in the astronaut office or yeah. what really motivated you to take your next career move. Sure. Um, so by the time I flew my fourth flight, the one that I showed the video of, um, so I had been in the office about 12 years at that point, and I had um, served in some of the more um, senior positions in the office where, you know, I headed the astronaut office support to the space station before anything was even built, which is what led me to, to be part of this Russian negotiating team. Um, and I led the group of astronauts that work in mission control and serve mm -hmm. as the communicators to astronauts in orbit. And I um, had a couple of other senior roles. And at the, when I came back from the, actually even before I flew on this flight, we were in a situation where more than half of the astronaut office had never flown at all. And that was partly because um, uh, uh, the station assembly had been delayed by um, some of the, like the habitation module, which Russia was supplying not being ready on time and various things. And then these initial spacewalks were pretty difficult, and so they wanted people who had already flown and done spacewalks to do them. Um, so there was going to be a, a, clearly a big push um, to fly people who had not flown before as much as possible. You never have a crew of all rookies, but, um, you know, to try to fly them. And I was part of the, the decision to say, yeah, we really have to focus on that now. We're at that point in the assembly where we can do that. So I knew for myself that meant um, I wouldn't be assigned again for a long time, maybe even never, who knows. I, probably if I waited around long enough, I would get assigned again, but it would be a while. And so I was thinking about what is, you know, what should I be doing something else? Because I, there weren't a lot of challenges left for me in the astronaut office as much as I loved it. Uh, and then I got asked to be this uh, position of deputy director of flight crew operations, um, which would take me out of, directly out of the active astronaut corps um, and then help manage the astronaut office and our aircraft ops division, which had about 40 aircraft at that time. So now you get much more into budget and personnel and policy, but you are still in that position, um, uh, you know, kind of giving a go, no go for the crew on, on, uh, on launch day and something that uh, I was continued to be part of my responsibilities, even as a center director. So I never got fully away from operational, which was good because I really loved it. And I felt like I had a lot of great experience that, um, was that I could bring to that job. So, so I was glad that I could use the experience I had and that the Johnson leadership positions, including center director, um, still put me in a mode where I was very much in an, um, a loop at least to give um, a final go, no go for being ready for missions and things like that. But I realized, okay, I, I really do need to do something different than just being an active astronaut. And so when this position came up, I, I said, you know, this is probably the, the right next move. It was probably the biggest move. It was bigger than moving up to deputy center director or director because I had been just focused on training and operational. And now 
um, I needed to understand more about how the whole government budget process worked, which I really had not paid any attention to. And you don't need to as an astronaut, really. Um, and, 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 and the personnel po policy and policies and, and who else all around the center supports these missions but that I had not really interfaced with in the astronaut office. I had to learn you know, the, who all the leaders were of all the other organizations um, and what they all did and how they all contributed. So that, that was a big step. And then six weeks later, we, we lost a shuttle. So that was a, that was, you know, that was a couple years of a huge learning curve and a very difficult and emotional time as well. Um, but I think then that prepared me for, for bigger roles that, that came from there. All right. Well, thank you so much. Yes. This was this was wonderful. I learned a tremendous amount. Uh, you're an inspiration, a hero. Uh, I'm so glad you were selected this year, uh, thank you. and uh, it's an honor to get to know you a little bit. Well, thank you. It was so, so much. Thank fun you so talking much. With you. And I know many of our students are interested in meeting you, and we Absolutely. have desserts set over up here. over here. Yeah. So thanks Thank so you. much. Thank you.